New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Guided selling from Ring DNA makes your entire sales team more effective by revealing exactly what reps should do and when to do it. Guided selling works by transforming sales data into a curated list of prioritized sales actions. So when reps start their day, they'll never again wonder which prospects and accounts or hot inbound leads to reach out to next. Guided selling even shifts reps' priority in response to real-time buying signals. Finally, even new reps can sell like seasoned ones. Let RingDNA be your guide to success. Learn more at ringdna.com slash guided selling. That's ringdna.com slash guided selling. It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 750 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record. Now, this is episode 750. I mean, think about how quickly time has flown. It seemed like just yesterday I was kicking off with episode one with my good friend Mike Weinberg. Well, and just like episode one, today I have another excellent guest lined up for you. Joining me this week as my guest is John Livesey. John, sometimes known as the Pitch Whisperer, he's a speaker, a podcast host, and author of a book that we're going to talk about today called Better Selling Through Storytelling. So we're going to talk about storytelling. Storytelling that makes you magnetic, it makes you memorable if you do it right. Among the topics John and I are going to dive into today are understanding the four elements of what makes a good story. We're also going to talk about the importance of that final big sales presentation, you know, that bake-off between you and your competition. And John will share some great ideas about how to use storytelling in that moment to differentiate yourself when everything is on the line to ensure that you win the decision and win the deal. We're also going to dive into the topic of PowerPoint. That's right, PowerPoint. We're going to talk about how to effectively integrate PowerPoint into the flow of how you tell your story. So we'll be getting into all that and much, much more. But before we get to John... I'd like to quickly talk about Ring DNA. Ring DNA is the leading revenue acceleration platform that uses AI to help businesses scale revenue growth. They offer a complete solution for sales engagement. That means you can call, text, email, automate sales cadences, and effectively coach your sellers and more, all from one tool. Only with a complete integrated platform can you supercharge rep productivity and optimize peak sales performance. So you can learn all about Ring DNA at ringdna.com forward slash Andy. That's R-I-N-G-D-N-A dot com forward slash Andy. And while you're there, download Ring DNA's free research report titled the 2020 Sales Prospecting Performance Report. It's full of actionable insights to help you build your sales pipeline, including data on the best time of day to call, optimal first call, conversation links, and much, much more. So you can get your copy today at ringdna.com forward slash Andy. That is ringdna.com forward slash Andy. Okay, let's jump into it. John, welcome to Accelerate. Thanks, Andy. Great to be back with you and your listeners. It's been a while. Indeed, lots has happened. That's good. Lots yeah, happened. yeah, lots has happened. So uh, we're going to talk about a sort of popular topic on the show today, which is storytelling. We've had several guests on recently mm-hmm. um, talking about that. So, and you have a relatively new book called Better Selling Through Storytelling. So what, given all that's been written recently about this topic, what was the impetus to write this book? What were you adding to the discussion? Well, Andy, I think I was adding 
the first the awareness that a lot of salespeople don't see the connection between storytelling and selling. And they think if they just push out a bunch of information, throw up a bunch of stuff against the wall, as what I was told in my early sales career, and see what sticks, that uh, that just doesn't work anymore. And that storytelling does two things. It makes you magnetic and, more importantly, memorable. Because people remember stories, not information. Right. And I, yeah, big believer in, in stories. But I... You know, setting aside sort of the value of stories, and I've mm-hmm. had this discussion with another guest recently on the show, is, was, but at the same time, I sort of feel like we're storied out because I, I see everything's being written about it. But when I listen to sales calls, when I listen to you know, recorded calls, or if mm-hmm. I'm watching somebody uh, in a particular meeting with a client, yeah, I don't see the ad- adoption. And so I'm really curious mm-hmm. to what you see as sort of this barrier between what we yes. acknowledge is the value of stories, but this, this barrier as to why they're not really used. Well, when I give keynotes to sales teams and sometimes workshops afterwards, um, the first aha moment is when I tell them we're going to turn your case study, even the word study sounds boring, into a case story. Mm-hmm. And that's when they get the green light. And I say to them, would you like to hear the case story that allowed Gensler to win a billion-dollar airport renovation uh, against two other law firms for Pittsburgh. And that usually gets people to sit up and say, uh, yes, I'd like to hear that story and learn how to tell my own case story. Mm-hmm. And so that's the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the old way of doing it for architects was to show their designs of the new project and to show some photos before and after of other projects they've worked on to show the transformation. I said, the visuals are great, but there's no story. So I teach people the four elements of a good story and how to turn a case study into that. And that's what hooks people into remembering, oh, we want to go on that journey with you. And the, the, I think the big misconception, Andy, is that salespeople think, oh, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to be the hero of it. Mm. No, your, your client is the hero that you helped. And you're the Sherpa or Yoda in Star Wars. Well, it brings up an interesting point about stories. Because I think that, again, one of the things that that I think is an issue is that so many of these books that are written about stories say they put a list together, right? Like I have ten stories you need to know, or seven mm. stories you need to know, and and the primary problem for most people is just knowing one story they can tell, right? <laughs> um, and if you really had to boil it down and say, okay, there's one. Let's just start with one. What's the one story every salesperson should be able to tell? Their own story of origin is what I start with. Because I believe you have to sell yourself, then the company, even if you're just a one-person company, and then you sell whatever product or service you're doing. Mm -hmm. And most people skip the first two steps. So people buy from people they trust and like and know. And if you don't have your own personal story of why you became interested in this industry or this particular job, um, then that's a big problem. So I work with people and let's make sure we craft your story. Uh, back to the Gensler example again, they have a team slide of, if you pick us, these are the people who will be working on your project for the mm-hmm. next five or six years. And so each of those people, I worked with them and pulled out an individual story as opposed to, hi, my name is Bob, I've worked here for 10 years, I do this. Boring, forgettable, blah. Mm-hmm. I said, Bob, what did you do that made you become an architect? What inspired you? Oh, well, I was 11 years old. I played with Legos. That's what inspired mm. me. Now I have a son that's 11. I still play with Legos with him. And I bring that same passion I had to this project. Boom. Very interesting and memorable. There's a little story about Bob. Okay, next person. Sue, where did you work before Gensler? Uh, well, I was in the Israeli army. I said, great. You're going to bring that same discipline and focus from being in the Israeli army to making sure this project comes on time and under budget. So now they start having individual stories instead of just a bunch of boring information about their backgrounds. Again, so we've got case studies turning into case stories. Now we've got team slides turning into individual stories that make people feel like they trust and like and know them. Yeah, and you write about in the book how you've inverted the know, like, trust to trust, Mm -hmm. like, know. Um, (laughs) And why is that? Well, I think the first thing is people think, again, oh, if I tell you a bunch of information, and then you'll like me and then eventually trust me. And I believe that that order is wrong. It starts from the gut, which is a fight or flight response that, you know, we have handshake came about to show you didn't have a weapon in your hand. So we have to build trust first. And then we go up to the heart, which is the likability factor. 
And that's really a salesperson's expertise if they can show empathy. I believe that the better you explain a problem, the better the potential client thinks you have their solution. And then it moves up to the head where they start it after they trust and like you, they go, hmm, okay, but will this work for me? I know you're showing examples of other people you've helped, but if I don't see myself in that story, I'm still not going to buy. So it's really important that you start from the bottom and work your way up, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about that because I'm, yeah, not sure I, not sure I necessarily agree with the, the starting with the trust. I mean, I understand that the handshake and, and so on, and there's been people written about the Amy Cuddy and others about you start with trust, then you worry about competence, where other people have written about start with competence, then, then move mm-hmm. to trust. I, I wonder, isn't, isn't the more interesting characteristic that people are looking for is, is not trust, but trustworthiness? I mean, one of the things I, I you know, we use trust so loosely. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and so I think about, okay, what's somebody going to buy from? Right. I mean, there's a level of trustworthiness they need to have for you to have uh, a belief that they can execute on what they're going to do. But does that really turn into real trust, or is that just you're you're taking a, a risk on the fact that they seem worthy of that trust? They seem to be. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, would you let them babysit your kids? <laughs> well, ne- you don't necessarily need to. I think I think uh, if we just keep it at real basic, simple brain, crocodile brain levels, that um, no matter what the situation is, we have to feel safe. And it's our exactly. Firefight. I agree. I agree. So it's just making your as a salesperson st- realizing that has to happen first before they even want to listen to what else you're saying. So that's what I'm saying. The, okay. Is the, the level of fight or flight is it safe? Is this person somebody? Are they making eye contact with me? Do they get a? Am I? Is it a warm introduction? Or your, our brain is just quickly searching through all those things to go. Okay, keep on the phone, stay in the meeting, pay attention. This is not a dangerous situation. I think it's a, you know, archaic brain thing that we need to a, a deal with in the first few seconds. Well, but you raise an interesting point. So it's one thing if you're doing it in person, because again, you have mm-hmm. these physical cues that you can actually see, yes. and even in a call like this, you and I are looking at each other, courtesy mm-hmm. of Zoom. But oftentimes, that first interaction is on a phone, and mm-hmm. so what are the cues that, in your mind, people are looking and picking up on at that point? Well, first, I want to encourage as many people as possible to use a service like Zoom or Skype or whatever, because... When I am being interviewed against typically one or two other speakers, I always ask to have a call like this as opposed to just a phone call because they get to see and so much more you can respond to in people's facial reactions. So whenever possible, use a video with your call. It's no reason not to with this technology. Um, Secondly, it's just tone of voice. Yeah, and I would just say it's it's part of your story, right? So the way Mm -hmm. you appear is part of your story. It's not just what you speak. It's who you are. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you 100%. If you get a chance, and that drives me nuts when (laughs) people don't want to do this, is, yeah, have these days, technology exists. Have a video call. Yes, right. Um, So that, it also shows confidence. A lot of people feel they have to be perfect all the time, uh, whether they're on camera or not. And so... That's a big part of my message in Better Selling Through Storytelling is to let go of this need to be perfect. And I tell our brain is wired to crave progress and celebrate progress. That's why the Fitbit watch, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of video games, we made it to the next level. So if we start focusing on how much progress we've made as opposed to having to be perfect every time, it really frees us up. And I um, think that includes being on camera. You don't have to look perfect every minute of every day. You just have to be authentic for people to want to relate to you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I like the reference to progress because I think that this is overlooked for the most part in sales is, mm-hmm. is companies have these sort of rigid sales processes defined by stages and they mm-hmm. look at how do we get from one stage to the next and start saying, has the buyer made progress? Exactly. And yeah. as opposed to, have we made progress? Well, I, again, completely look at that from, you know, when I was selling for many decades, you know, everything was, this is an A prospect, 90%, a B prospect, 50, a C prospect, you know, 30% or less. And nobody who's a buyer thinks of themselves as a percentage. Well, well, no, the percentages are flawed anyway, because you can say, look, you know, if we hit the proposal stage, we're at 90%, but, you know, if you have three competitors also presented proposals, you don't have a 90% chance of winning, just mathematically. So I tell people, stop looking at your 
potential buyers through your lens and start looking at it through how they see you. And that's what incentivized me to create the ladder that you probably have read about in the book, uh, mm-hmm. how to go from invisible to irresistible. And that really becomes a new roadmap for sales teams to start saying, where are we on this ladder and what can we do to move up a rung as opposed to we see them as a percentage. All right. Well, before I get into the ladder, is, is I want to go to uh, something you sort of talked about in the beginning of the book, mm-hmm. which is always a, a trigger for me. And <laughs> In a good way or a bad way? Do well, we need to send in a therapist? <laughs> well, yeah, usually not a good way. Uh, okay. But I'm self-medicating, so I'm okay. Um, right. Is is you're right that uh, you say the old way of selling is to push your message out. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, any reference to old way of selling is a, a trigger for me because, first of all, you've been around longer than many, but oftentimes when you hear that written, it's by people who have no idea mm. what, what selling was like. They just assume it was different. So, yes. so tell me, what, what do you mean by the old way? Because you know, it's sort of ironic to me. It's, you know, you've written a book that's selling through storytelling, but it, a good chunk of it's really about presentations and – yeah, presentations are pushing your message out by and large. So, interesting what you what you meant by that. Well, I think that having sold for many years, and when I was trained in competing against IBM, which sold by fear, yeah. uncertainty, and doubt. Me, me too. I competed against um, them, and it was certainly um, we need to, you know. And I had a, you know, was working for a company that had a less expensive, faster computer. And I realized that there's a lot of other issues going on besides just price and information. Mm -hmm. And so um, that sales training did not include storytelling uh, back in the 80s and 90s. No. So that's what I mean by the old way. And as I referenced earlier in our conversation, you know, management would say, just keep, it's volume. Just throw a bunch of stuff up and something has got to stick. That's the old way. Well, but, okay. And the reason I ask that, because that's really the new way too, right? So if you look at the explosion of inside sales teams and the movement to inside sales where you know we've seen incredible growth in employment with SDRs that many companies have they use as SDRs to pound out phone calls um, you know it's what's old is new again and I, I was just wondering to me that's like hey that's really the way a good chunk of selling is sort of taking place these days it's we measure people on their activity levels as opposed to the quality of what they actually do mm. Well, I, I recently was hired by Redfin, which is a tech company that's disrupted the real estate agents mm-hmm. uh, world by not paying their agents commissions. They pay right. them a salary, which allows uh, people selling their homes to save money. And they're using technology to drive traffic to their website to get more eyeballs. And so the way, But they drive people in. So instead of, the again, the old way of real estate people trying to go out and find clients... Um, Redfin is using technology to generate leads, and they have a whole sales team of people on the phone mm-hmm. uh, explaining the differences and uh, then ideally setting up appointments for the agents to uh, be interviewed to get the listing. So um, I think there is a new way of doing it, and I worked in depth with that particular sales team on the phone of how to let go of some of that, oh, you know, to whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? Oh my God! Just have a conversation with people. <laughs> well, but that—that that is one of the real barriers, though. So let's let's dig into that a little bit because mm-hmm. is again in this world that's it's evolving and and um, yeah, these these people. I said SDRs measure an activity. They've got a certain amount of time to engage the interest of the buyer, mm-hmm. and really, a conversation is the last thing that happens. Really, that's because uh. I've got you know, hey, I've pressure i've got 10 seconds to engage this person's interest right and yeah well let me, let me give you an example so they the sales team was taught to ask the person's name so that they could use the person's name in that sure. conversation sure that's been around forever and so 99 percent of most people are companies are still saying to whom do i have the pleasure of speaking and i say that is not conversational nobody ever says that when they meet somebody in person mm-hmm. so i role played with them and i said i'll be you and I'll be Redfin and you be the person calling in. Sure. I said, hey, my name, hello, my name is John. I'm from Redfin. How can I help you? And they said, oh, I'm looking at blah, blah, blah house on whatever. Um, they're like, okay, great. Um, just in case you didn't catch my name uh, I, at the beginning, my name is John and you are? And they go, oh, I'm Bill or Bob or whatever. Sure. That is conversational. It doesn't take any more time than the 
who whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? And so those little shifts in being real and conversational allow you to have a more authentic connection, whether you're in person or on the phone. Yeah, and it's interesting because I was, I was, and I agree on that. That's that is more conversational. I was really talking about having a conversation, though. And this is well, you'd be surprised how they go. What is motivating you to sell your house? And then sometimes it becomes a short little mini therapy for some people. Mm-hmm. Somebody died. <laughs> I just got divorced. That person needs to show empathy, whether you're on the phone or in person. And the more you show empathy, as I talked about, the more likable you are. And they're like, okay, these people get me. I want to work with them. Yeah. No matter where your sales team is working from, Ring DNA can enable them to be more productive and effective. Ring DNA offers a complete platform for remote sales teams that gives reps the tools they need to connect with more prospects and create more opportunities and drive more revenue no matter where they're working from. And managers can get real-time insight they need to coach reps to success. Win more deals from anywhere on the planet with Ring DNA. Learn more about how Ring DNA helps remote teams at ringdna.com slash remote work. That's ringdna.com slash remote work. New alarm bells ringing tonight on the coronavirus outbreak in this country. Doctors say the virus is spread through droplets when someone coughs or sneezes. And I think the business community, it's in their interest that people actually stay home and stop the spread. For a business that can allow more employees to telecommute, we want you to do that. Hi, friends. I'm Andy Paul, host of the Sales Enablement Podcast. And I want to encourage you to listen to my brand new special six-part podcast miniseries titled Selling with Purpose. The team behind Sales Enablement Podcast and I have put together this incredible series of inspiring conversations exploring what it means to sell with a mission greater than just hitting your numbers in this era of COVID-19 and beyond. So tune in to hear from world-class enterprise sales leaders and learn how their six companies will close $50 billion selling remotely. See how they've supported essential workers with the products and services they need to stay safe and thrive during this time of crisis. Subscribe to Selling with a Purpose now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So, so going through further then into your book is, is, is and I was curious about this because what you see is because I see a lot less of the sort of formal stand-up presentation these days. And, I mean, at the end of the book, you give this you know, succinct 12-slide template mm-hmm. for putting together a PowerPoint presentation. But, um, again, maybe with companies you work with, you're seeing different. But, but yeah, I, 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 let, me, let me adjust the industries that are still having to do this. Sure. Arch- architects. They get, you know, they send a proposal in that you're in the final three. You each have an hour to come in and present in person for an hour. Sure. And um, that determines who wins these big airport renovations, lawyer re- redesigns, what have you. Um, it, it, just, lawyers, clarify, just to clarify, yes. in that case, that's sort of the culmination of the sales <clears throat> process. It's not yes. the beginning of the sales process. They have done no. everything, but, but hey, come in that's, and sum up what, what you've told us so far. And give us a reason to hire you versus the other people. They, you know, they were told by the airport, we're going to hire the firm we like the best. If you're in the final three, you can all do the work. Mm-hmm. And that's when I said, get John Livesey in here. Mm-hmm. We need some help on the likability, empathy stuff, the mm-hmm. soft skills, mm-hmm. confidence, mm-hmm. storytelling. So architects still do it. Executive search firms. I was speaking to DHR International. They compete right. against Corn Ferry. Same situation. Big companies bring them in for the bake-off, shoot-off is one of their concepts, they call it. Right. You have an hour to present to us why we should use you for our next CEO search or board of directors search. Um, ad agencies, PR agencies, lawyers call them beauty contests. Right. And lawyers now never used to be able to legally sell themselves, and now they realize they have to. So I've been doing a lot of work with the legal industry uh, on how to use storytelling as a way to get hired as the firm of choice. Okay. Um- well, let's, so let's dig into that in, in context because yeah, you know, you've you've obviously had a ton of experience in that. Um, is so I guess my first question is 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 PowerPoint still effective? Because yeah, I think back to my own experience. I've worked with a lot of startups, raised a ton of money, you know, met with mm-hmm. tons tons of VCs and so on, and and yeah, we always saw this correlation that if we could, if we had to go to the a partners meeting at a VC firm, and if we had to 
turn on our computer, we probably weren't going to get the deal. Mm. But if we could just sit and have a conversation with them and maybe stand at the whiteboard, draw things out and so on, then much higher possibility of, of connecting with them and you know, telling our story in a much more effective right. way. So that was sort of part of what was motivating that question is, is in those environments is, you know, do you still see people sort of defaulting to say, yeah, let's put our deck together? And, yes. it's, and do they go in saying, yeah, we're going to give this pitch? Or again, maybe we were unusual. We just said, last thing we want to do is give this pitch because then we're mm. not connecting with them because they're all going to be on their phones, their eyes rolling back in the head, so on. Anyway. Right. I think it's uh, two different situations. One, when you're pitching to get funding, is a completely different situation than when you've been invited to come in and pitch for an hour to win the business against two other competitors. Mm -hmm. they, the client expects a deck. The competitors are using decks. And people remember things they see visually. The big mistake using PowerPoint is reading from the slides. So when I gave my TEDx talk, you know, I had a whole lot of preparation and worked mm -hmm. with graphic designers to make sure that it was images that triggered a conversation that I made eye contact mm -hmm. with the audience to get the conversation. So the use of visuals works. The use of reading from slides does not work. Right. So, again, so how do then, if you've got this deck and mm -hmm. you are a sales rep and you've been, you know, called on the by the compass when you come and say, hey, make your final pitch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how, they sh how should they prepare for that? Well, they need to have a really strong opening and a really strong closing. That's, and I tell people to reverse engineer your talk or your presentation pitch, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. What do you want the audience to think? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to do? When I work with teams on answering those three questions, we then craft the, oh, the closing. Because some of the worst closings I've ever heard before um, I started working with them would be, well, that's all we got. Any questions? <laughs> like, oh, my God. No, 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 no. So a good closing sounds like something like, uh, we'd like to invite you to join us on this journey. We realize the importance of creating an airport here in Pittsburgh that reflects the city's new values and reputation. And this will be the first stop of people's uh, first impressions and you don't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. And um, some of us are from Pittsburgh, so this is not just another job to us. This is a home game for us. Right. And we promise we'll be committed and we're going to um, make this something that we're all proud of. That's a, that's a much better closing than any questions. That's all we got. Yeah. Same thing with the opening. Uh, a lot of people waste that first. But, but the one you just gave, I know I don't be picky because I know you're just doing it <laughs> extemporaneously, is, but there should be a call to action there somewhere, right? Because you're saying what you want them to do. Well, I say we want to invite you to join us on this journey. They're not going to make a decision on the spot. It's not like you're whipping out a contract. Sure. Um, that is the next call to action is letting them know that you want them to hire you. Mm -hmm. And that's asking for the order in that subtle way okay. without going, you know, please hire us. That's not how I would end the call. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And so then you said, how do you make the them think and how you make them feel? So think, just, feel, and, and do. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. We want them to think that we're the best team. We want them to feel like we understand them better than anyone else. And we want them to pick us over the competition after they've seen all the uh, presentations. And this is the other big thing is people say, oh, we try to go last when we have to go up against competitors. I said, well, you can't, con we think whoever goes last is the most memorable. I said, but you can't control that. That's a problem I'm solving for companies. And they go, whoever tells the best story, both in the case story and in the team story is going to be memorable, not the order you present. And when I told that to the executive search firm, the light bulb went off in the CEO's mind. He went, Oh my God, even if we're first, we'll be setting the bar with good stories. I said, mm -hmm. yes. So you're hired. Come teach my team how to do that. You know. Right. So a good story to make people think. Yes. And memorable because, you know, we remember stories, not information because it all starts to blur together uh, when you're listening to a bunch of statistics of, you know, square footage or whatever you happen to be selling. The other problem is wasting time in the opening. You know, even if you're given an hour, you really only have 90 seconds, just like in a 10 minute pitch for right. investors. Right. And a lot of people open it. Well, thanks for this opportunity. I'm excited to be here. First of all, that's cliche. Nobody, rem it's, it's nothing memorable. It's nothing unique. And it's nobody cares that you're excited. And you would be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, Andy, how difficult it is to get people <laughs> to let go of that as an opening. Uh, right. And so well, the uh, yeah, it's about you have to make it so a good opening sounds like this. 
your CEO has tasked you from getting this airport ranked from 24 to number one in five years. We're just the team to do it. We did it for JetBlue at JFK, and that's what we're here to talk to you about to help you make your goals. Perfect. Yeah. But again, so many people, and I'm interested when you talk about the the, the team story and origin mm-hmm. story and so on. Is is yeah, I find that companies, sellers, whatever, really. Yeah, you know, they default to sort of the standard corporate capabilities type crap that no mm-hmm. one really cares about. No one cares about two people finding the company in a garage or starting the company in a garage. Uh, what do you see contextually as sort of the best way to frame your your story? Mm. Well, I do a deep dive on the companies that have hired me to help them win pitches and figure out what's on their websites, mission statements, cultural uh, issues, whether it's they, we celebrate diversity. What and then I look for statements on the potential clients' websites. And sometimes we can find a real match and we'll pull a quote from the potential client's website and put that up on a slide and say, this is your message, but it could easily fit on our slide as well because our branding and our culture has a very similar fit. So you're, when you're selling the company, you're selling the mindset. We value collaborative conversations. For example, at Gensler, they have two CEOs. They're both co-CEOs. They mm-hmm. don't have a star architect. Mm-hmm. So they have, a, they have a story of of how they differentiate themselves. And if they're talking to a law firm that has a similar philosophy, then um, that all automatically goes, oh, we're already in sync. We're global. You're global. What that means to you is that wonderful benefit statement. You know, we're going to have consistency across all your offices. Um, you know, we're, we have, so it's figuring out what it is about your company that fits their brand and their culture is great another way to check off a box of oh this is the right team for us yeah it's, it's sort of interesting because i was uh, thinking about it, i was reading your book and and because you know these days in b2b sales we you know we talk about the vast number of stakeholders involved in making the decision and and helping to shape uh sort of the options the customer has to choose from mm-hmm. and and typically the way it often works is that you know a Client and and yeah, may not be a complete fit for the ones that you're talking about, you know, large municipal projects and so on. But is you know, typically somebody go out and talk to vendors and say, look, we're going to come up with a final set of specifications for what we're trying to do. And and you know, you referred to the case of IBM. IBM, yeah, I competed with them at the beginning of my career as well, uh, back in the the FUD days before they got uh, divested and broken up and so on. But is is um, you know, usually you got that final spec. That final spec had somebody's thumbprints all over it, mm-hmm. and you knew if it wasn't yours instantly, right? It's like, no, we're, we're screwed in this this regard. Um, so, yeah, you know, a project like an airport and so on is probably no different, right? So, I just sort of curious as to is yeah, you, know, you sort of get to this last stage, but there's been so much influence you've been trying to exert in this process to get designed in, to, to have their final vision of what they're going to buy mm-hmm. is really almost shaped before these final presentations take place. So I, I, just, I, I wonder in this day and age, given how we sort of seen thing evolve, is how critical these are for really for influencing the final decision as to what vendor to go with. I think it's still very critical. I think um, sales are made or won in those last one hour bake off shootouts, whatever beauty contests, whatever you want to call it. Despite there might be a little bit of, uh, oh, we think we want to go with these people, but if somebody has a compelling enough story and can wow them in that hour, they I've seen people change their mind and go with that person or that brand. But that's sort of the question I was asking is they've already heard that story, right? I mean they've already they've already talked to all these people. I mean they they know the story of the the vendors and so on. It's it's like so what's what's new in that last hour bake off as you're talking about what what's new if you're a seller and you're in that situation it's like okay what well, we've run through this whole thing they know our entire story they know our capabilities we've told all of our stories already to get them excited to get us to this point because they haven't disqualified us we're mm-hmm. one of the finalists uh yeah what, and it becomes you people are buying you just like in a startup they're investing in you and that's where the in-person energy comes through it's like you know Uh, We're going to hire the people we like the most because we have to work with you for the next five Mm -hmm. years remodeling this airport. So that likability, the empathy is what comes through that doesn't come through on the paper specs. Okay. Well, that's a good answer. And that's what I would have expected is is I think that 
too often this is downplayed these days in sales is thinking is that yeah we've, we've automated everything we yeah we just the human aspect isn't important you know if people have written articles on linkedin about <laughs> relationships and sales that's bs there's no such thing da 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 Mm-hmm. And I'm of the mind and a belief and through my own experience and seeing what's going on is that yeah, actually this, this human connection is more important than ever. Exactly. And, and yeah, if, if this final bake-off is a way that you further solidify that connection that you've been building with someone, I mean, this mm-hmm. doesn't create a whole cloth at that point. Yeah, it's very important to pay attention to it and make sure you do a good job there. And prepare. Don't wing it. Well, <laughs> Yeah, other- yeah, you'd like to think that goes without saying, but yes. It isn't, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah it isn't. It's, and that's sort of the problem sometimes with salespeople who think they can talk their way in or out of any situation. Is that, mm-hmm. Yeah, but sales is, yeah, I've had this message for a long time with people. You know, sales is about preparation, not improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you know, there might be elements of improv, and you refer to it in, in your book even, mm-hmm. um, in terms of how you respond to questions and so on. I mean, it, drives me nuts right. when somebody asks you a question and they say yes and then the next phrase they link to but and suddenly somebody has a negative in their mind instead of as you kind of you talked about in your book is yes and oh yeah yeah okay great we're building on what we've heard before we're not exactly. taking away from it yeah very very important um yeah interesting book um thank you Andy. so yeah recommend people Take a read, and why don't you uh, tell people they can find out more about the book and also connect with you. Sure. Well, if anybody wants a free sneak peek of better selling through storytelling, all they have to do is text the word PITCH, P-I-T-C-H, to 66866, and they get a free sneak peek. Um, They can go to my website, johnlivesay.com. If you can't remember any of that, just Google the Pitch Whisperer, and all my content will show up. The Pitch Whisperer, soon to to be uh, located in, in Texas. Yes. Making the move. California, emptying into Texas. Yes. <laughs> All right, John, it's been great talking to you again. Appreciate you your too, time. Andy. Thanks cool. for having me. All right, talk to you again soon. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me, and I want to thank my guest, John Livesey. Join me again next week as my guest will be Lance Tyson. Lance is the CEO of the Tyson Group, a sales training company, and author of a really excellent book titled, Selling is an Away Game, Close Business and Complete. Hey, let's start the top of the outro. Okay, friends, that was Accelerate for the week. First of all, as always, I want to thank you for joining me, and I want to thank my guest, John Livesey. Join me again next week as my guest will be Lance Tyson. He's the CEO of the Tyson Group, a sales training company, and author of the really excellent book titled Selling is an Away Game, Close Business and Compete in a Complex World. We're going to talk about what it means that sales is an away game and how that mental image shapes how you should connect and communicate with your buyers. And as I said, it's an interesting book and a great conversation. So you'll definitely want to join us for that. So again, thanks for joining me this week on Accelerate. And until next week, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. RingDNA is the leading sales enablement platform that uses AI to help scale business growth. Trusted by the top companies across the globe, RingDNA offers a suite of powerful tools for every sales role. The RingDNA dialer radically improves sales productivity and call connection rates, while guided selling helps reps know exactly what to do and when to do it. Conversation AI uses artificial intelligence to surface the most impactful coaching opportunities in real time. So no matter where your team is working from, the Ring DNA platform can help them exponentially increase call connections, opportunities, and revenue. Learn more at ringdna.com slash platform. That's ringdna.com slash platform.